Everybody visiting with us tonight, first time, we want to welcome you to Temple. We're glad to have you. Make yourself at home with us. You folks watching by the internet, we're live streaming, we'll watch this later. Uh, join in with us. We're glad to have you. You're a part of Temple Baptist Church when you're on that and you're watching in. Amen. I was reading the book of Ezekiel. If you'll turn to chapter number 34, Ezekiel chapter number 34. It's quite a scathing rebuke, one of the worst in the Bible. Ezekiel 34 and verse 1, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel, prophesy and say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God unto the shepherds, Woe be to the shepherds of Israel that do feed themselves, should not the shepherds feed the flocks. Father, bless your word now, anoint it as it goes forth, and anoint this messenger. I need you tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Now in verse 3, he said, You eat the fat, clothe you with the wool. You kill them that are fed, but you feed not the flock. And over and over and over and over again, the prophet Ezekiel rebukes the shepherds. The shepherds are a very personal thing to the children of Israel. He led them. The Lord Jesus Christ, when he came 2,000 years ago, called himself the good shepherd. In John chapter number 10, verse 13, he said, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep, and so he did. He did that to bring us out of the wilderness. He did that to give a uh, wall that cannot be crossed because that's a blood-bought wall. It puts over the doorpost and lintel. There's no way Satan can violate that blood covenant and that blood atonement. The Lord Jesus Christ is our good shepherd, no question about that. All the other religions in the world, they have no one who died for them. They have no one who died for them. There are some languages in the world that don't even have the word love in that language. Did you know that? Not even in their language, not part of it. But we know the love of God, don't we? We do in 1 Corinthians 13. There's no other love like it. And you know, you've heard it a million times. It's agape love. It's the love of God. And we're not capable of the love of God. We're not capable of producing the love of God. That's the gift of God by the power of the Holy Spirit who's able to do that through us. So he is definitely our good shepherd. In the book of Hebrews chapter number 13, verse 20, the Bible said, and the God of peace that brought again from the dead, our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you perfect in every good work to do his will, working in you that which is well-pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom he glory forever and ever. Amen. Well, as the good shepherd, he died for, it, for us. As the great shepherd, he intercedes for us. He lives for us. He's at the right hand of the Father. A lot of Christians don't really put much thought into the fact that once he saves you, he saves your soul, but he'll also save your life. But saving your life is a progressive thing. It's all the days that you live on this earth, and what he saves your life by is the power of the Holy Spirit of God. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. I don't want to be led into temptation. I want to be led by the power of God. I want to submit myself and be obedient unto the Holy Spirit of God and be able to hear and feel the movement of the Spirit and not quench him or grieve him. And this is how you live your life. You live your life in fellowship with the Lord. And all of this is based upon what the good shepherd purchased when he died for us. And as the great shepherd now, he ministers through that by the power of the Holy Spirit. When he came into this world, the Holy Spirit, he came into this world commissioned. He was commissioned. I will send the Spirit. And he was commissioned to come with that message and with that power that was purchased at the cross. Then in 2 Peter chapter number 5, or 1 Peter 5, it says this in verse 1. The elders which are among you I exhort, who am also an elder, and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. Feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind. Neither as being lords over God's heritage, but being in samples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd shall appear, ye shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. So what is the chief shepherd? Well, he's certainly the good shepherd, and he's certainly the great shepherd. 
But being the chief shepherd, that means he is the greatest among others. He's the chief of all the other shepherds. I'm a shepherd. And uh, you may call it, may refer to that as an under shepherd, a bishop and an elder. But he is the chief shepherd, not me. He is the one who is over all. He's over all of us. There's not a, there's not a soul on this earth that even rises to his level, much less above him. He's over them all. So the apostle Peter called himself an elder. The Greek word is presbyter. We get the word Presbyterian from it. So what is an elder? An elder is a minister. He's an ordained minister of the gospel. And so uh, look at Acts chapter number 6. You'll notice that it may give you a good comparison to understand what we're talking about with elders, deacons, bishops, and so forth. In Acts chapter number 6, the scripture says in verse 1, In those days when the number of the disciples was multiplied. Now we're all disciples in here tonight, every last one of us. Every one. I have never met an apostle. I've read a lot of what the apostles said, but I've never, now I may have met some who thought they were, and I don't want to be mean to anybody tonight, but I don't recognize anybody's apostleship. The apostles are not here with us today, but we are disciples, every one of us. And in those days when the number of the disciples was multiplied, a disciple means a learner, folks, a learner, a follower. There arose a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews. We have two competing cultures. We have the culture of the Greeks and we have the culture of the Hebrews. The northern part of Israel was what was called the Galilean area. It was called the uh, Decapolis. Deca in, uh, in Latin is ten. Polis is city. So it literally means the ten cities, the Decapolis. And of course it had uh, Greek culture because of the fact that it was in the north. And it collided, believe me, with the, with the orthodox religion of the Jew in Jerusalem and in Judea. There was a great problem. And I'm sure that when the early church began to form and you had Grecians that were saved and Hebrews that were saved, they both became Christians. Truth of the matter is, Hebrew and Greek really doesn't mean anything. In Christ, there's neither bond nor free, male nor female, Jew nor Greek or whatever. You know, no color, no color distinctions, ethnicity or whatever. But you still had this issue of cultural clashes. And so a problem came because their widows were neglected in the daily ministration. Then what we have here, folks, is a form of um, socialism. No question, it is. Somebody may point that out to you sometime and say the early church started, well, they were socialists. Yes, they were, but they busted it up as soon as they could. <laughs> if you'll remember when the, the plantation, what was his name, Bradford, William Bradford, he was the first, uh, the first governor of the Pilgrim's Plantation there. And uh, for the first uh, year or two or three, whatever it took, they, they combined all of their, their food, their efforts, and everything was combined so they could survive and help each other. They had to uh, at that time. But he wrote in his diary, he said, the time came when some of them didn't want to go out into the fields and do their part. But then when food was served, they were first at the table. And he said, this created a problem among the others who went into the fields and worked and for that one who didn't work. And of course, it does create a problem. The fact of the matter is this, folks, and if you haven't learned it yet, you need to learn it. Some folks will work a whole lot harder than others. Yes, they will. They will work much harder. And there's an element in society that all they know how to do is stick their hand out. Now, we believe in feeding people. We feed, and one thing that bothers me is to hear about hungry children. That eats me alive. I can't, I can't stand that. And we will, go, we will go out of our way and be the first to help anybody who needs help. But I'm talking about social issues. And that's a fact. You learn that. That's a fact. So what they are doing is sharing their resources here at the beginning. And when they do this, they have a daily ministration overseen by these people. Then the twelve called the multitude of the disciples to them and said, It is not reason, now note carefully, this is important, that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Is there anything wrong with serving tables? Absolutely not. It's an honorable thing. It's a needed thing. It's something that, that brings great respect upon the person who does it. And it, is a, and it is a place in the body of Christ that it needs people to do that. And this is servant. Now, the word, the word deacon that we have in English is, is what you call a transliteration. So what's that mean? That means that you take the Greek word, diakonin, and you transfer it over into English and don't translate it. 
you know, get as close as you can. But the meaning of the word diakonin means servant. That's what it means. Some say, and of course you can do the, you can do the etymology on it and run it down. Uh, they go so far as to say it means a runner through the dust. But there's no way that I would malign the, uh, the, the idea of a deacon. I, I, you know, I don't like to use that. He's a servant. We're all servants for that matter. Every last one of us. And I think a deacon is an honorable thing. Very honorable. Now what you have here though, this is what I want to show by comparison. This is how we learn. You'll notice that the Apostle Peter said, I am an elder. He said that of himself. And, but he's also an apostle. And, but he says that here in Acts chapter number 6, we've got a problem. And the problem is something that needs to be taken, by, taken care of by someone else other than elders and apostles or bishops. And who takes care of it? Well, they chose seven men full of the Holy Ghost. Word deacon doesn't show up, but it's mostly accepted that that's who they're talking about. And I, I think so too. They took care of the ministration. They took care of, uh, of taking care. For example, someone needed food. The deacon comes to help them. Some mother needed help. Here comes the deacon. Some sick one needed a physician, or provisions rather, medicine, a place to stay, and on and on and on and on and on. The deacon is the one that the church sets aside to be there, to be, to be uh, conscious of what needs to be done to help people. And that's a good thing. And any church should have uh, that consciousness to where somebody is taking care of that issue. But now here's the thing tonight. Listen carefully. Before a deacon was ever chosen, the church had elders, and it had bishops, and it had apostles. Why? Because these are the ones who minister the spiritual things to the souls of the people. And it's very important to understand that when you are an elder, that you have stepped into a world where you are accountable and have a responsibility and it's not something that you literally just choose for yourself. It's something that God put on you. I didn't call myself to preach. The fact of the matter is, if my wife had had anything to do with it, I wouldn't be preaching. But I didn't do it. I didn't call myself to preach. But he did. And that's something that I had to give an account for. I had to answer to it. So when you do this, you, your life is set apart. This, this is your life. It's not something you just choose to do for a while, this and that. No, you are an elder for the rest of your life. Now, you may not be a bishop. You may not be a pastor of a church, but you certainly are an elder. In other words, you are an ordained minister of the gospel capable of ministering the word of God. That's the difference between the deacon and the elder. The elder, if he cannot minister the word of God, has no business trying to be an elder. You see what I mean? You have to, and, and of course, that demands study, and it demands preparation. You have to study to show yourself approved to God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And preachers and ministers get their education in a number of different ways. Some never able to go to a Bible college or a Bible institute or anything of that nature. That doesn't disqualify them. They're qualified by their call from God. And however they're able, sometimes they have to work and feed a family and they have certain responsibilities. And so they can't go to school. So you would never disparage one if he has dedicated himself to the work of the Lord. He can learn on his own. And now, of course, with all the technology we have, good night, man, you've got, you've got a commentary after commentary, research books and all of this, research papers. Um, an abundant uh, amount of uh, material is available to study. And so I'm all for it, but I am not against schools. Not at all. I believe that Bible colleges and... Uh, and uh, even seminaries, they, have, they, have, they fulfill a place uh, necessary. It's a place where you need to learn what you're doing. You need to know how to minister. Because I'm going to show you in a few minutes why one of the reasons it, it is so important if you're going to be an elder, an ordained elder in the church of God. Now, you know, in all the years that you've been, how many of you have been Baptist for a long time? Raise your hand. Oh, I've got a long time Baptist in here. All right. Down through all the years that you've been going to churches here and there and so forth and so on, how much have you heard said about elders compared to deacons? Which one did you hear more about, the elder or the deacon? That's a problem, big time. And the reason for that is because a lot of the churches and established by some of the hierarchy 
believes that the purpose of the deacon or a deacon board is to counter the authority of a pastor. That's what it's for. That's why you hear all, that's why all you hear about is deacons. That's as unscriptural as it comes. That's not one word in that New Testament that puts the word rule next to a deacon, but the word rule goes next to an elder. Not even an elder that may be a pastor of the church, just the fact that he's an elder. But I don't get ahead of myself. So the work of a deacon is needed and it's a blessed thing. And if a deacon is chosen, placed rightfully, and taught and understands clearly the position and place of responsibility, he's a blessing to the church, and it's all a blessing to the church. It really is. But if they go in with the attitude that, well, you know, here, we're here to keep the preacher straight and keep him lined up and so forth and so on, you've got a problem. Because what you'll do then is you're going to be butting heads. And I've been in churches like that. I've been in churches, and it's no good. How many of you have been in churches where you had issues with deacons? Raise your hand. <laughs> See what I mean? See what I mean? And this is not bash deacon night. <laughs> this is not beat up on deacons. Not at all. I'm just trying to teach as a, as a bishop, as a minister, as an elder, the church of God. What does the Bible say? Well, let's see what it says. In 1 Timothy chapter number 3 and verse 13, For they that have used the office of a deacon well purchased to themselves a good degree and great boldness in the faith, which is in Christ Jesus. So they are to be blessed and to be respected and honored. And that's what they should be. Now in 1 Timothy, in 1 Peter chapter number 5, and verse number one, Peter said, the elders which are among you I exhort. Note carefully that there's more than one elder in the church he's talking to. See this? Elders, plural. He said, I exhort. Who am also an elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. You see, the, word, the office of an apostle is from the Greek word apostello. Apostello, and it means a sent one. It's like, a, it's like an admiral of, of a fleet. The admiral doesn't command a ship, he commands a fleet. A captain commands the ship. And uh, therefore he has to oversee all that's involved with that fleet or that, uh, like, this, like these uh, aircraft carriers that are over there right now. They have all these supporting ships that go with them. All right, now this is what we're talking about tonight. An apostle was not chosen to pastor a church, see. He was chosen to lay out the foundation for the church and to choose the elders that go into that church. That's what the apostles did. And it's, a, it's built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, remember the New Testament. So what he says here, he said, I'm an elder also, which means that he's qualified to be a pastor of a church then. Here we have an apostle with a dual office. He's an apostle and he's also an elder. And he said, I'm a witness of the sufferings of Christ and partaker of the glory that should be revealed. He says to the elders, feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind. Now note carefully, being lords, not as being, neither as being lords over God's heritage, but being in samples to the flock. There are men who absolutely are, have no business trying to pastor a church. They have no business. If they are dictator type people, you know, my way or the highway. You can't reason with them. You can't talk with them. You can't come to any kind of, a, of, of an agreement on what needs to be done. Bring the issues forth. Church will never grow. And there will always be division. There will always be strife. A man like that is not a leader. If a man cannot listen to someone and sit down and deal with issues and work for the betterment of the church, the body of Christ, led by the Holy Spirit, he's not qualified to be a bishop. Not at all. And I'm afraid that uh, you can get on YouTube and look at some of these people, and I'll tell you, I swear, some of them get way, they go off the rails. Some of these preachers, the way they deal with people, and that's, that's ridiculous. You shouldn't feel like that you are being ostracized or run off or kicked out because you may not agree with certain things with a pastor. That's how you get issues taken care of. So I'm not, uh, should never be a lord over God's heritage. I should be an ensample to the flock. In plain words, I should never preach something to you that I'm not myself willing to do. Or I should never require something of you in leadership or in responsibility or what have you that I myself am not willing to be subject to myself. You see what I'm saying? Right. And that has to be. 
But if you notice, the apostle Peter's made it very clear. He said, this elder takes the oversight thereof. Someone has to be accountable. They have to be. They have to be. I want you to notice the way it handles it here. In verse number uh, 12 of 1 Thessalonians 5, we beseech you, brethren, to know them which labor among you and over you in the Lord. Do you see that? And admonish you. It doesn't mean they're greater than you, and it doesn't mean they're closer to God than you. It means that they are accountable more to God than you are. A lot of folks come to church and decide to go somewhere, do this or do that. And, uh, you know, at a very good question to ask them is, will you accept responsibility for souls? They would wilt in a heartbeat. But I do. I have to. If you're going to pastor, you're going to accept responsibility for souls. It's that simple. It can't be both ways. Hebrews 13, salute all them that have the rule over you. And all the saints, they of Italy, salute you. And the Bible says in Acts 20, verse 17, And from Miletus he sent to Ephesus and called the elders of the church. Notice who he called. The Apostle Paul now is going to deal with the church at Ephesus and he's going to deal with problems that are going to arise. Okay? He didn't call for the deacons. He called for the elders. He called for the ordained ministers of the gospel. He called for the men who had dedicated their life to the word of God. That's who he called. Why? Because they were qualified to deal with what he was going to bring up to them. Would you know a heretic if you saw one? Do you know heresy when you hear it? Heresy comes in different forms. And it comes in different degrees. Some heresy is horrid. It's a wicked thing. And some heresy just deviates a little bit. But that's all it takes is to deviate a little bit. And problems begin to develop. So therefore, the elder is responsible to be on the watch, on the lookout for heresy. He's got to. He absolutely must be on the watch. And today, <laughs> Lord help us. There's every kind of a heresy in the world floating around where we live. Acts 20, verse 28, it says, Take heed therefore to yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers. You who? We'll go back to the context, the elders. He called the elders of Ephesus together and said, the Holy Ghost made you overseers. And he said, you feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. And I'm going to give you a little bit about sheep in just a few minutes. Some of this, I'm sure, a lot of it you probably already heard. But it's always instructive to learn a little bit about sheep because I've never been a sheep farmer. <laughs> and the only thing I'm ever going to learn about sheep is what somebody else who knows what they're talking about uh, can teach me. And so I read what they have to say. But he said, a grievous wolf will enter in. And then he says, of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things, to draw away disciples after them. So when he says to these elders at Ephesus, he says, you be on the lookout for this because God's going to hold you accountable for the wealth, health, welfare of that group of sheep and for that group of people. You're accountable for it. And that's quite a thing. In Titus 1.5, for this cause left I thee in Crete, that thou shouldest set in order the things that are wanting they didn't have time to get the church order established the way it should have been. The apostle had to leave. But here's what he says to Timothy. This is in Titus 1. He said, for this cause I left you in Crete, that thou shouldest set in order the things that are wanting. This has to be done. And what's the first thing he says? Titus 1.5. Somebody said it. Ordain elders. Right off the bat, ordain the elders. What about the deacons? The elders will take care of the deacons. The church will take care of calling the deacons. The deacon's job is for spe most of the time for a specific need. And when the need arises. But the absolute necessity for this church to be functioning is for the elders. In Hebrews 13 verse 7 it says, Remember them that have the rule over you, who have spoken to you the word of God, whose faith follow, considering the end of their conversation. And then Hebrews 13, 17, obey them that have the rule over you and submit yourselves. Now here it is. This is a grave thing. For they watch for your souls that they must give an account. Obviously from scripture, God's going to hold somebody accountable. Somebody's accountable. 
Well, there's nobody that I can pass the buck to here at Temple Baptist Church. My head's on the chop block. It is, and I think about that when I go to bed at night, when I get up in the morning, when I read that Bible and I pray. I say to myself, is heresy seeping into the church? What's happening at Temple? Because I'm accountable. And I know that. And the only way I know that I have peace with God is to know I've got peace with God because I have fellowship with the Lord. And he knows that I'm not perfect and no elder is, no bishop is. Now, I'm an elder. All, 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 all elders are not necessarily bishops, but all bishops are elders. And elder is the term that to, to me is precious because that means I'm an ordained minister of the gospel. We have a number in this church right now of ordained ministers of the gospel. Some of them are former pastors. They are elders, fully qualified to teach and preach, minister the word of God. In that we're blessed. So a lot of you didn't, may, may not have known that. But Temple Baptist Church has a number of them right now. Ordained elders, ministers of the gospel. So they must give an account and they watch for your souls. Now I can get into a long thing on that tonight, but I want to use this because I think this is very instructive. I've told you about Godfrey Bowen. How many of you folks know where New Zealand's located? Okay. Best way to find New Zealand is to find Australia. And then go down a little bit, down a little bit, and there you'll find New Zealand. It's in what's called the Southern Hemisphere. Now, of course, if you're a flat earther, you got mad at me because there's no Northern and Southern Hemisphere, but I'm not a flat earther. This is a round globe, tilted 23 degrees on its axis, and so forth. But, you know, well, can you be saved and believe in a flat earth? Of course you can. <laughs> uh, but... Uh, Anyway, it's the, right now, we are going into winter, okay? If you were in Australia, where would you be headed? Where, exactly, exactly. It's reversed. Here in the north, northern hemisphere, which direction does a hurricane turn? Counterclockwise. In the southern hemisphere, do you know which direction it turns? Clockwise. Yeah, sure does. Did you know that you're standing on a big magnet? Big magnet. It's got a North Pole and a South Pole. Well, you have to ground something because you're standing on a magnet. It is. It's a powerful magnet. They can understand the magnetism, but uh, there's a thing that they still cannot get it right, and I sure don't have the answer to it either, and that's what's called gravity. What is gravity? Don't have a clue. But I know one thing, if it wasn't for it, you'd fly off into the sky. I mean, you'd, you'd take a trip into the heavens in a heartbeat. So that gravity is keeping us on the earth. It's almost as if the one that made this thing meant for us to be able to walk around on it. You know what I mean? <laughs> sure. Now, here's what Godfrey Bowen, he was one of the greatest sheep men in the world. He held, I don't know how many records in being able to shear a sheep. Nobody could shear a sheep faster than him. He knew his sheep. And he wrote a book, and you can get it. It's called Why the Shepherd, Godfrey Bowen. I read this book about 30 years ago, 35. Uh, it's on Shiloh 1. If you get on the Internet and type in Shiloh, they've got a lot of the old books, and uh, this is one of them. Now, I'm going to take five of the sheep that he mentions here, just five. There's more, but I want to give these five to you tonight to give you an idea of what an elder is responsible for because I have to watch out for this. Number one is the lost sheep. Here's what he says about it. He says, it is frightening to be lost. It is more tragic to be lost if you are a helpless sheep. The sheep is the only animal in the world that can be lost within a, only a few miles of its home. It has no homing ability. It has no, way, it has no ability to find its way back. Therefore, it is totally dependent upon the shepherd to keep it in home or keep it where it should be with the people it should be. In other words, the elders. And the elders, of course, account, give an account to the chief shepherd. And of course, we all know who that is. So you can't find your way home. You know, it's an amazing thing how the cults out here say the greatest mission field in Knoxville, Tennessee is the Baptist church. I've heard them say that. I'm talking about the cults that deny the deity of Christ and every kind of a false doctrine there is. They like to come into the Baptist church and pluck up people, see? pluck them up, and lead them off into that. The second thing about a sheep, 
a hungry and thirsty sheep, this is what Godfrey Bowen says, people may not be aware of it, but sheep spend most of their time, most of their lives, eating and drinking. Well, all you got to do is look at me and you can tell them and I'm pretty well fit that. Grazing, munching, and ruminating. They're often thirsty and hungry, especially when left on their own without a shepherd. Now watch this. Sheep must have water to quench their thirst and food to nourish their bodies. On its own, a sheep cannot find its own food. Now, man, that's sad. I mean, that's sad. So he leadeth me beside the still waters. Yes, he prepareth a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. My cup runneth over. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. The word want in that context means I shall not be in need. Yes, he'll take care of it. Does he do that for us? Of course he does. Of course he does. The first food that we need more than anything is this book. You need that book, the Word of God. They jump on me all the time about, well, you believe the King James Bible's Word of God. Don't you know errors in it? Well, who told you it had errors in it? <laughs> I've yet to find one who points out all the errors in the Bible who found it on his own. He'd been reading somebody. And, of course, there are no errors in this thing. Rightly, rightly read, understood in context, Every word in that Bible, I believe it. No problem with the Bible. None. But anyway, the hungry and thirsty sheep, therefore, is totally dependent upon their shepherd to feed them. Now, here's something else about a sheep. They can get very unclean. Here's what Godfrey Bowen says. Whenever we bring to our mind's eye the vision of a sheep, we most often imagine a soft, pure white lamb. Or maybe the image that comes to mind is a blue ribbon champion sheep that we have seen at a sheep show or country fair, a clean, white, trim, manicured, polished beauty of stately character. The picture's artist paint always seem to present this image of the sheep, but the sheep are seldom clean, pure, and white. In the real world, they are more likely stained and colored by their natural habitat their fleece contains grease, dirt, seeds, and vegetation blown by the wind and picked up from contact with grass, soil, and brush. This is amazing. A sheep cannot clean itself. Once it becomes soiled, it remains dirty until the shepherd cleanses it. Well, now, this pastor can't cleanse you, but I know the chief shepherd can. Been washed in the blood of Christ. Remember the washing? has cleansed us from all our sin, purged us. Yes, he does. See, it's my job as the sh shepherd or, the, or the, the elder is to point you to the one who can clean you. No man can clean you, folks. No man can absolve you of your sins. That's just a bunch of religious malarkey. The only one that can absolve, and he doesn't absolve, he cleanses, he forgives, he washes it away, is the chief shepherd. Amen. So I'm telling you where to get clean. And somebody said, well, I don't need to be clean. The one who tells me you don't need to be clean, you need to be clean more than the rest of them around you. <laughs> All right, now here's the next thing about a sheep. There is no animal in the world as defenseless as the sheep. It, of all animals, is the most vulnerable to attack by a variety of predators. The sheep has no defense against attack. This is the defenseless sheep. So what? What does that mean? Well, that means that I'm no match for Satan. None of us are a match for Satan. You know, come on, Satan, let me take you on, buddy. No, no, but greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. Amen. Your adversary of the devil is a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may. That's right, devour. So a defenseless sheep in my own power and ability and authority, there's nothing here but who I belong to and where my life is hidden is all the difference in the world. I have every bit of defense that I need. I have all the weapons that I need and the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty unto God to, the, to what? Uh, exactly, pulling down of strongholds. Give no place to the devil. What's that mean? 
That means that if you allow bitterness, hatred, greed, or any of the sins that, that eat your soul alive, if you, allow it to, if you allow it to incubate in your heart and your mind, first thing you know, you were going to give place to the devil because he'll come into that place and he'll establish a stronghold in your life. In other words, a fort. A fort. And that fort is unassailable if it's built right. And that means that from that fort he sends out his, sends out what he wants to do to destroy your life. And that stronghold, you've got to assault it. You've got to tear it down. And how do you do it? Confess it. Bring it to the Father through the Son. Confess, confess, confess. And plead the blood of Christ. And he'll tear it down. Amen. So the sheep is defenseless. And, and then last of all, and this is the most, this is the part that really gets into the heart of a bishop or an elder, and that's this, a wounded sheep. Now this is odd, but listen to what Godfrey Bowen says. In Psalm 23, the sheep is speaking, he restoreth my soul. Have you ever stopped to contemplate the deeper meaning of this poignant passage? We readily grasp the meaning of the other phrases. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness. But what does it mean when the sheep says, He restoreth my soul? Well, he says, consider this theme. Of all the animals, a sheep is the most vulnerable to physical attack and to deep inner injury. It is not only a matter of the inability to defend itself from, from predators, perils, and dangers, but it is a matter of weakness of spirit. No other animal is so easily broken in spirit. Think about it. And that's how Satan works. The scripture says, who can heal a wounded spirit? Well, there's only one that can. So what does the pastor do? The pastor tries his dead level best to keep you from having to go through fields where your spirit gets wounded. To keep the enemy away. To keep the wolf away. To keep the lion, the bear. That's what David did. He was one of the greatest shepherds in the Bible. No question about it. No question. Now, the word I-D-L-E. What does that word mean? I-D-L-E. It means idle, right? That means... You're not doing anything. Sitting, you're idle. Okay? What does the word I-D-O-L mean? Well, I, now this is the thing about English. They're both pronounced exactly the same way. This is why the people over there in Europe get mad when they try to learn English. Idle, idle. Idle shepherd. Idle shepherd. One shepherd sitting down. The other shepherd is being worshipped. That's what idolatry is about. Some men like that. When a pastor gets to the point where he wants praise and adoration and worship, and it happens, and I've seen it happen too where God takes them from this earth. He will not share his glory with another. But an idle shepherd is one who doesn't care for the flock. He doesn't care one bit for it. And away he goes. I read a thing today, and it broke my heart when I read it, but I think it might help you. This lady commented underneath uh, one of the messages online, and she said, our church gave a, uh, we gave a, uh, a homecoming. We had a homecoming. And we invited, uh, we invited all these people, prepared all the food, and, uh, and uh, nobody showed up for the food. And then for the meeting that followed a little later, a few people showed up for that. And she said, we just sat there and looked at each other, totally heartbroken, you know, discouraged how you talk about spirit can be broken so for an hour they sang hymns you know I guess embarrassed to a degree or whatever and then they went home well the pastor went to the woman who was responsible for organizing the meeting and inviting the singers to come in and all of that and asked her what happened well she got angry so he contacted the singers that were supposed to come. And the singer says, we didn't know anything about it. That's, that's odd, isn't it, don't you think? 
Well, it caused an uproar, and they, people, they, got, they got mad at each other, you know, strife. Satan's in that. He loves strife. And so what did the pastor do? He tucked tail and ran. He quit over that. And now the woman who wrote the thing is heartbroken. She says, we've got five families left in our church, and if we just sit here and said, we're having one temporary pastor after another coming in preaching to us and their spirit's broken their spirit's broken because the bishop didn't do what he should have done he should have carried him through it he should have stuck with it uh, if you've making a mistake acknowledge the mistake you've made if you if something needs to be done do it but stick with a flock a sh flock of sheep without a shepherd imagine what happens to them and it happens quickly yes it does it happens quickly. There must be that shepherd. So in order for the pastor to have the respect of his people, like I'm talking to you tonight, you must, you must certainly have to believe that I'm willing to stick with you if the enemy comes or whatever might come. is to stay with you. is to see that Temple Baptist Church flourishes. And it will flourish. God's opening up uh, ministries here. He's opening up the future to temple. There's an awful lot that he intends to do in this church. And I thank God for it. It excites me to think of what he can do. We are in a unique situation tonight, folks. Some of you have been in church a long time. There is no way in this world that you can take this church today, or any church for that matter, and compare it to a church of 1950. We don't live in that world. We live in the world of 2023, about to get into 2024. And there are ways to minister to people today that didn't exist in 1950. They didn't exist back there, but they do now. There was a time in the past when churches reached out by going door to door, knocking on the doors. Man, we've done it. I've knocked on every door around here. Walked the streets and knocked on the doors. But now you have an element that's called the internet and other ways that people can be reached. We had a Sunday school, had, had a teacher. We've got, a, we've got teachers in our church, a number of teachers here. And she said the other day that some of the kids that come to her class, that come to her class, she teaches, I don't know the subject matter, but she teaches. And these are little children, like this. She says they come in, they're hungry. They haven't eaten. They don't have anything to eat. This, this inflation has just about destroyed a lot of homes. Some people are working two and three jobs to pay their bills. I can't stand the thought of a child not having something to eat. This church could meet that need. Yeah, it sure could. This church could feed some children, couldn't it? Yes, it could. Yes, it could. These girls today, we've supported for years. Uh, I forget the name of the place over there. These unwed mothers, these girls, they get pregnant and, and, and the, the man, he's, he's gone. Well, she's got the baby. And so who's going to take care of that baby? And thank God she lets it live and gives it life and it comes into the world. Well, we've supported them. I think that's a good thing. And we don't come down with a hammer on top of them, beating them to death, preaching to them. We show them the love of God and, and minister to them. You have to know how to minister to people. And there's a lot of other things that need to be done. Kids today are suffering. They're paying for it. They're always the ones. The children are always the first ones to pay when, for the culture when it begins to deteriorate and this culture is deteriorating Temple Baptist Church has been blessed I am honored to be the pastor here I am blessed believe me and I have every intention by the grace of God to seek God's will in his face and how that we might minister if you have ideas I'm open to them I've already been talking to my wife about that I want to be having some have meat with, uh, with the workers of our church and start getting our heads together and see what we can do to reach people, reach out to them and minister to people. I'd like to see that happen, would you? When I was just a kid, my brother and I were taken to a hotel over here on, Clint, on, on Chapman Highway and they had a party over there and the guy came into the house and he was a big brother. He was a big brother, I'll never forget that. And he took us over there that night and they had ice cream and cake and they had all clowns and just a, just a kind of a party atmosphere. And I'll never forget how nervous I was. I was a real 
real shy folks you would not believe you would not believe how shy I was if I liked a girl in high school and she was walking down that side of the hall I'd get over here scared to death I'd get too close to her I mean I was shy and uh, but anyway I, I couldn't even enjoy it but I'll never forget the man who came and got us and took us to that I'll never forget that it was a big brother now I've had a lot of things happen in my life that I've forgotten I'll never forget that Never. Why don't you pray about that tonight? Pray about what God can use you, how he can use you, what he can use you for. And there's a lot of openings here at Temple Baptist Church. A lot of openings because there's a lot of things that need to be done. And pray God blesses them. Father, thank you for the time we have together tonight. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right. Anybody have